Hi, I'm Bill Corcoran Jr. This is the On The Stacks Podcast. Oh yeah, whoa, look, they can never keep me down, I'm going, and if I ever fail to snow, I'll go again. I never quit, because I know that every loss may lead to another win, I'm going up. I used to practice my signature. Why? Because I always thought that I was going to be something. Um... I always wanted to believe I was going to be something, some kind of professional athlete, whether it was baseball, basketball, golf, bowling at the time, whatever it was. It was, it was, it was something that I thought um, I wanted to see myself as and something I wanted to work towards. Today, I'm chatting with professional golfer Brandon Matthews. This episode is brought to you by the Pest Rangers. Finding insects in your home can be a real pest. I know I felt that way when I discovered termites living rent-free in my house. But thanks to the team at the Pest Rangers, I'm no longer bugging out over this issue. So if any creepy crawlers are cramping your style, there's no if ands or bugs about it. You've got to call the Pest Rangers. For more information on how to rid your home from unwanted pests, call the Pest Rangers today at 570-826-1114 or visit them online at thepestrangers.com. This episode is brought to you by Kavanaugh's Grill one of my favorite places to eat and drink in any PA. They've got one of the best outdoor patios with 13 TVs and over 20 beers on tap. You can also dine inside at this cozy Irish-style pub where your beer never goes empty. Did I mention how delicious their food is? Their in-house smoked brisket, barbecue ribs, and wings are to die for. So grab your friends and have a drink on me at Kavanaugh's. Mention code STACKS for one free draft beer with purchase of any entree when you dine in. Located at 163 North Main Street in Mountaintop, Kavanaugh's is open at 4 p.m. during the week and 12 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday during football season. Dine in today at Mountaintop's only Irish-style pub. This episode is brought to you by Burn, the fitness company behind the Today Show-approved Burn Board. If I'm being honest, working out can be a real chore, especially as a new dad in desperate need of sleep and cardio. Burn is founded by NEPA native Jimmy T. Martin, and his burn board offers a low-impact core and cardio experience unlike anything I've done before. They have hundreds of on-demand workouts that are great for beginners, seasoned athletes, and out-of-shape podcast hosts who love supporting small businesses. My wife and I use it pretty frequently throughout the week, and it's honestly a great way to burn a ton of calories without burning a ton of cash. Not to mention, it's a great tool for skiers, runners, wrestlers, and hockey players. Jimmy is offering all On The Stacks listeners 15% off when they use the code STACKS15. Visit theburn.com today to get 15% off your purchase with code STACKS15 at checkout. Again, that's theburn, T-H-E-B-R-R-N.com to get 15% off your purchase with code STACKS15. It's time to get on board today with Burn. What's up, podcast? It's Bill Corcoran Jr., host of the On The Stacks podcast here in the Blue Door studio, protected by our friends at Richie Security Solutions. Brandon Matthews, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bill. Looking uh, absolutely, forward to it. Absolutely, man. And uh, and welcome home. Thanks. Yeah, ha- crazy. Ha- how's it feel to be home? Uh, wild. It's been a uh, whirlwind of a year. So um, to be home and kind of uh, relax a little bit for a couple of days, well, not really relax. I have my uh, charity event up at Scranton this weekend. Um, which honestly, everybody that's listening to this or sees any of this, and uh, I'm going to do a couple of media things on Friday. Everybody's encouraged to come up and watch. We have some PGA Tour professionals, some guys who used to play on the PGA Tour, um, some up and comers coming up and playing. Um, it's going to be an awesome event, and we're going to raise a hell of a lot of money for charity too. Awesome, that's really cool. You do that. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah. And and you also just got married. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations to me. Condolences for her, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's awesome, man. Good for you. You got you got a lot of stuff going on right now. Yeah, no, no. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been, like I said, it's been an awesome year. I'm uh, fortunate enough to have a rock star of a wife. And she's, uh, you know, she stays busy herself. And um, she's doing incredible with her career. And um, incredibly proud of her, what she's doing. So it, it, it works out really well for the both of us, um, that, that we're able to kind of both stay busy and, and do what we have to do. Yeah. It's great to have a super supportive wife, right? It's, it's, it's amazing. It's yeah. always, uh, it's always, it's always, good. I say, I say the same thing about my wife, you know, she's always, she's just, she's so super supportive of, of everything that I do. And like I always tell everybody, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be able to do all this stuff. No question about it. It was, uh, I was actually, um, 
playing with a guy yesterday that was telling me a story about uh, Bruce Fleischer. Bruce Fleischer said, I'd be Jack Nicholas if I had Barbara Nicholas as a wife. And, uh, and he's like, nothing against my wife. I love my wife. But, you know, Barbara Nicholas encouraged everything, encouraged him to go, 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 do this, do this, do this, um, and encouraged the work ethic that he had. Never really complained that, hey, hey you know, I mean, that's the one thing Danielle's unbelievable about. She's like, you're at the golf course, just stay there. Like, stay there until dark. Go there when the sun rises. Like, I'm never, ever, ever going to get mad at you for that. You married the right woman. I sure did. Yeah, good for you, dude. Thanks. That's yeah. awesome. Congratulations again. Thank you. Yeah, so On the Stacks will be back in a flash after our word from our sponsor. There's a larger community impact in handling malpractice cases. Uh, bad doctors in bad hospitals or hospital administrators need to be held to account to ensure that all residents of Northeastern Pennsylvania receive adequate health care. At our office, when we handle a claim on behalf of a, cl of a client, we not only pursue their claim and achieve justice and get them back on their feet, but we also ensure that the hospital policy that caused their injury or the doctor that caused their injury or the administrator that caused their injury is held accountable and either changed or removed so that it doesn't happen again. We really try to improve healthcare in Northeastern Pennsylvania by making fundamental changes at hospitals to ensure that all residents and all patients are treated fairly. And now we're back on the stacks. All right, so you're home, you're home, you know, for, for not a lot of time, but like, you know, like when, when you do come home, like what do, you, what do you look forward to? Like what do you look forward to when you come back to Northeastern Pennsylvania? Pizza. I, yeah, I knew it. I, I was, mean. I was going to ask you what your favorite I mean. pizza was. Well, Carla Russo's. Okay. That's, that's kind of a fam family thing. So, I, I mean, I have to say that. But uh, it is it actually is my favorite, though. The tomato garlic's off, off the charts. Oh, solid. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I'm probably going to take a few guys there on Saturday um, that are coming in for the charity event. So, that'll be fun. But, yeah, I mean, I, I look forward to that. Um, obviously, seeing people that I haven't seen in a while. Um, the greatest thing about this area is that I can come home and never skip a beat no one looks at me differently um i don't have to put on a different face for people um and not, not that i have to do that often it's just back here i'm just so comfortable um it's it's a nice nice feeling to have um and you know it's it's pretty cool not a lot of people know this we, we have some pretty amazing golf around here um and when i tell people about the architectural background that's here. And once they kind of understand it, they're like, wow, like how did that happen? And it's, it's kind of a cool little thing. Like the coal era obviously was booming and Scranton was booming then, you know, that was golf architecture, like prime time. So, you know, we have, we have some amazing golf courses, um, some amazing people around here. And um, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, I just really enjoy coming back when I'm able to. Yeah. So like, all right. So when you're, so you're, you're living in Florida, mm -hmm. right? But you obviously you travel all over the world for golf. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're, you know, traveling golf, doing whatever you're doing, like, and, and pe when people ask you like where you're from, like where's home, like, how do you explain, how do you explain to people where you're from? I just say Scranton, honestly, because that's the only way people know where I'm from. Cause they don't know Wilkes-Barre, right? And, uh, correct. And, uh, so like, I mean, I'm directly in the middle of Scranton and Wilkes-Barre where I grew up. So, um, it's funny. <laughs> I almost sometimes don't even say Scranton anymore. I just say, did you ever watch The Office? Dude, I say the same exact I thing. I mean, that's the only thing. And they're like, oh, that, that's a real place. And, and then you're like, yeah, that's where I'm, I'm from. Like, no, that's a real place. Like, well, how did you not think that this is a real place? Are you like <laughs> geographically like just completely out of touch? Like, what, what, what do you mean that's a real place? Yeah. So, um, yeah, people are kind of funny about it. And uh, but. Yeah, it's again, it's it's amazing. Obviously, we're coming to the time that uh, is the reason why I live where I live now. Um, but the um, end of spring, summer, beginning of fall here is, is pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. So, so you're 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 in town for the tournament, right? And uh, you got you got a lot of other a lot of other tournaments coming up, man. You got a lot on your mind. How do you uh, how, Crazy. how do you how do you keep it all together? It's hard to. Yeah, I mean. It's, you know, the, if, if someone has played as much golf as I have this entire year and, and listen, I love golf more than anybody that plays golf for a living. 
I can honestly say that. I really do. I love everything about the game. I started this charity event um, for a couple different reasons. I mean, the first and foremost reason is to give back to the community that I grew up in because I think that's just so important to give back for what shaped you. And beyond that, I love the pro-am aspect of golf. I love bringing the, the business owners, the CEOs, the people that were successful in life that love golf so much and do it as a hobby with the people that they would give anything to hit a golf shot like once. And so it, it, that's a really cool aspect because also the opportunities that are involved with that. Um, I was talking to the, actually played in the pro-am with the uh, director of the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am a couple weeks ago in Napa. And I was talking to him. I said, Steve, honestly, like, I'm not joking when I say this. Like, your tournament's one of my favorite tournaments because it encompasses what golf really is, what it, what it truly means, and how valuable it can be for everybody. And um, so it, everything involved with golf and also the fact that it's an individualistic sport. That's one of the reasons why, you know, I stopped playing everything else because it's like you can go pitch a no-hitter and still lose a game. And everything is on you with golf. And that's a pretty cool aspect for me because I've always had a good work ethic. And I'll give you a quick, cool little story that explains how important work ethic is, right? So Tiger um, just got finished with his round and John Daly was in the lead by one going into Sunday and John's in, in the uh, men's grill on his about sixth or seventh beer. <laughs> That's right. And uh, Tiger walks in the locker room. He goes, hey T, what's going on? He goes, JD. He goes, come on, just have one beer with us. Come on. Tiger goes, John, if I had your talent, I'd be doing the same thing as you are. And he just walked away. And so the, the greatest athletes in our sport of all time have had a work ethic that outperforms everyone else. So I think that's just a cool thing that if you're able to put in the time, obviously there has to be a, a little bit of talent level there to, to get wherever. But if you put in the time and effort, you can kind of achieve anything you want. Where do, where do you think your work ethic at, at work ethic comes from? Um, you know, I, I watched my dad at a young age um, stay at work for a long time and do what he had to do to, you know, provide for his family. And I think a little bit of that, and I also think I just get obsessive over something very quickly. Um, and I, I, my dad, I think it's more the competitiveness that the work ethic comes from. My dad had a ton of competitiveness in him and uh, he instilled that in me and I did not like to lose. <laughs> so, all right, so let's, let's talk about the, the obsession thing. Cause I, 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 I like to talk about that because I'm kind of uh, of the same mindset we'll say, right? So, so you, you, you say you obsess over things and you obsess to, to probably to, to be the best because you, you absolutely love golf to the point mm -hmm. that you're obsessed, right? No question. Yeah. So tell tell me about that. Like how, how, how does that, how does that help you perform at the highest level? So yes, it does. If I use it in the proper way, um, I'm still learning, you know, I'm 28. Um, I, I still think I have a little bit of time to go to learn and truly be disciplined enough to use it to my advantage. Um, I play too much golf. That's my downfall. Um, and people are going to say, well, what, what, how is that your downfall? Like, what? It's the fact that I'm going from tournament to tournament. Uh, my mind gets very tired. And I kind of almost slightly burn my, I don't want to say burn myself out because I'll give you a story about that in a second. But I get, I get very tired. I get a little bit um, just repetitive with, what I'm doing um, instead of, all right, let's do two, maybe three weeks in a row and then take a week or two off and then come back completely refreshed, ready, excited. And that's that excitement is 
what is going to drive you to put in those hours, right? So I've been trying really hard to kind of find the perfect balance of, all right, what are we going to do? How are we going to figure out a way to relax? And then when you come back, really go as hard as you can on the days that you're able to go that hard, but also realize how important rest and recovery is, especially, you know, for me, I've, I've had some injuries and stuff like that, that eventually, you know, I'm going to need to get taken care of, but you know, I'm at a point in my life, a point in my career where it's a really important year for me. If I'm able to have a good year, maybe I can win once or twice. Um, but mo most importantly, make sure I continue to keep my tour card, make the playoffs, finish in the top 70 in the regular season and go from there. Then that takes a lot of pressure off me. Um, financially, the way I can provide for, you know, my family and then generations moving forward and things like that it just takes a little bit of pressure off. And then I can maybe, you know, go fix my injuries a little bit that I've had and then come back even stronger and be able to do the things that I want to do. But anyway, um, the burnt out thing, I do want to tell you a quick story because this is pretty good. So <laughs> this one guy that I know, incredibly successful guy, he's one of my closest friends. He's, um, he's 80 years old now, about to turn 81. And he owned a very, very successful um, steel industry in Pittsburgh. And his work ethic was so off the charts. And he expected perfection from everybody. And he didn't believe in anything less than that. And that's why he was so successful. So I come back when I was at Temple um, from playing about a five week stretch, I think. And, um, he goes, Hey, what happened that last tournament? You got up to like, you know, 45th in the world, like in the amateur world rankings, like, you know, you, you go and shoot 80. I'm like, honestly, Mr. C I think I got a little burnt out there toward the end. He looks at me, he goes, burnt out, burnt out. He goes, Ben Hogan got hit by a fucking bus. And I look at him, I go, you're not wrong. I'm going to go hit some balls. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I, when I, I don't like to say burnt out anymore because of that. And we always joke about, about that. And, uh, but he's right. Right. You know, like, so, you know, the, the burnout factor only comes in mentally, really physically, you can get over that hump as long as you're doing all the right things. But, um, you know, if you need a mental break, you can take a, a day or two off mentally. But, um, you know, physically, the work ethic always has to be there. Yeah. How do you prepare mentally? You just got to believe. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I believe I deserve to be where I'm at. I believe I deserve to be above where I'm at. Um, I believe I've worked hard enough to get there. I believe I've worked hard enough to stay there. So, um and also the, the vision of it, right? Um, seeing yourself doing the things that you want to do lead you to do those things. So it's the, the grand expectation theory, right? So that's a, that's a big part in, in, in the way I mentally prepare for things. And um, I'm trying to think of the guy that it was. Um, gosh, I can't think of the name right now. But there's a story of, of uh, someone that was playing. Um, I think it was I think actually it was Hogan. And there's a story about Hogan. I was just actually reading reading a book about it, and Hogan practiced writing his acceptance letter. The week that he was about to stop playing golf, and there's like there's a couple. I'm not sure if that's the exact story. But there was like a couple stories about him mentally like going and practicing his smile in the mirror before, you know, the final round of a tournament and doing things like that to prepare his mind that, you know, he's, he's going to win that day. And so there's certain things you can do to just and it's not even tricking your mind, but it's, it's preparing your mind for for what you believe is going to happen. It's manifesting, right? Yeah, no question about it. 100 percent. And kind of earlier, before before we started, you, you signed uh, you signed one of your gloves for me. By the mm -hmm. way, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, and I, I complimented you on how on how nice your signature is. 
And it just it you telling that story right now reminded me of that conversation we had before we came on. So take me through that again. Yeah. So it's it's crazy. So I mean, I went to college school, so you know we we had to have good handwriting, right? And I I, I always loved writing. You know, I always loved writing in cursive. I always thought it was very important, and it helps me to this day. Because everyone, you know, at, at the beginning, you know, people, like, you write like a girl, like, you know what I mean? Then it was making fun of, and now it's like, oh, everyone's like, you have such nice handwriting. And I like to write handwritten thank you notes to people. I think that's a lost art. And I think more people should do that because it's very, very important. But writing those thank you notes in, in good cursive is always good. But I always like to practice it. And I always was kind of, again, the obsessive perfectionist, whatever. And, um, I used to practice my signature. Why? Because I always thought that I was going to be something. Um, I always wanted to believe I was going to be something, some kind of professional athlete, whether it was baseball, basketball, golf, bowling at the time, whatever it was. It was, it was, it was something that I thought um, I wanted to see myself as and something I wanted to work towards. So you basically manifested that from a young age. How old were you when, when you... When you said that you were started to really practice that signature, God, I, I how far how far back could you remember? It was it was a while. Um, I mean, it had to start as early as 10, 11 years old. That's young. Yeah, yeah. So at that age, you're like, one day I'm going to be signing signing my name and handing this out. Yeah, and I really started. Um, you know, I started doing it then. And then I really, really got back into it when I started realizing who Arnold Palmer was. Um, He's got I, a nice signature. I think that's that's a big thing. And um, obviously him being from Pennsylvania as well, he, he grew up, uh, the way he grew up, and I always idolized him. I thought the way he conducted himself, um, and I mean, everyone, he was the king, right? So um, in the way he was towards people and the way he treated everybody. Um, he was never, he was never standoffish. Um, in his later years when he was at, whether it was at Latrobe, Laurel Valley, um, his places that he was at in the summer or whether it was at Bay Hill during the winter, if you approached him and you, Hey, I'm, from Northeast Pennsylvania. I've heard countless stories from Northeast Pennsylvania. He said, oh, are you really? You know, I've played so and so. I played this place, this place. Come on, sit down, have a drink with me. And that's just something that I think I've always strived to be. And I've, I've always said it's, it's a lot harder to be an ass than it is to be nice. Um, and, you know, you learn that over the years. You know, um, and there's also a happy medium too, which I, again, I'm still learning. Uh, and my wife is teaching me a little bit in that sense that, you know, you need to be a little bit more selfish of your time in order to, to reach, um, your goals, goals fully. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Right, so, so kind of talking about, you know, home and NEP again, a couple of things I also want to touch on. First of all, shout out to our friend Lorenzo Medico for, no question for, about it. For hooking us up here and getting us the best. Yeah, getting us introduced for you. Low to, the voice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and <clears throat> and the Curtis family. From what I understand, you and the Curtis family go go way back. I got. And I was telling you beforehand, uh, Eric Curtis. Mm -hmm. uh, he he edits uh, the video of the show here, so he's gonna make you look really good. I, I not would that you hope don't so. look good, but he's gonna make you look like even better. I would hope so. So shout out to also the Curtis family. You guys go way back. We do. Yeah, they grew up right up the street from me. Um, I mean, I used to be at that house more than, more, I mean, probably more than I was at my own house growing up. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, yeah. So I've known, known all of them since I've been a little, little kid, you know, five, six, seven years old. Yeah. And, and so, and, and what about like your dad, like you, you know, when, when was it that, you know, did your dad kind of got you into golf? Like how far back does that go? So I have a picture of a putter over my chest and a Greg Norman straw hat. Um, on my head at my christening. That's very so young. That's pretty young, right? Yeah, as young as you can um, get, I think. Yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, you know, I I had so I moved to the house 
um, that I grew up in in DuPont when I was, I believe, two and a half years old. And there's pictures of me at the first house that we were at in Durier with plastic clubs uh, in the backyard there. That was, I mean, the backyard was, I mean, it was no bigger than this. You know, it was like a little like two by four backyard. Yeah. And um, so I, I remember hitting, I mean, the one, the one thing I have, I'm fortunate enough to have is a good memory with, with certain things going back. And, um, Danielle always makes fun of me about it. Um, but like, I, I actually truly remember like hitting plastic golf balls over that fence in Duryea. So that was about, you know, I would say one to two years old was when I started like actually picking it up a little bit. And then my dad used to take me in the car seat and put me in the cart up Emanon. Um, my grandfather used to take me to Pine Hills and go over on the short course over there, the par three course. And then I always used to, he always used to tell the story, you know, he always used to say, grandpa, take me on the big course. And like, you know, so that's kind of a cool little thing. But um, when I stopped playing all of their sports, um, was probably around 14, um, really, really started focusing on golf. And now you're on the PGA Tour. It's kind of wild to say. It I is. I don't think, I, I still haven't realized it yet. It hasn't hit you? I'm just too busy for it to hit me yet. What, is, what does it feel like? Explain it. it. How, what, what do you think? What's going through your mind? Just keep working hard. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I'm i not letting it hit me yet because... It, Professional golf is so different, right? It's individualistic and you have to continue to keep going. Um, the stage I'm at right now, um, it's very important for me to play well this fall because the category that I'm in, to put it in like the simplest terms, so there's 50 guys in my category. It's a zipper order. So it goes n number one from the regular season, number one from the finals, number two from the regular season, number two from the finals. So that's one, two, three, four. And it goes that way all the way down the list. So I'm 19 on the list because I finished 10th in the regular season. So I reshuffle after the fall in my own category. So it depends on how I am stacked up against the rest of my category after the fall. And that depends on what tournaments I'm going to get in um, next year, at least at the beginning of next year. So it's important for me to obviously get in as many tournaments as possible so I can set my schedule a little bit better. And I mean, it all takes care of itself if you win, right? That's why I kind of bust people and tell them I'm like winning solves problems and what I do. So you just got to beat everyone else that week. Yeah. <laughs> what's a, what's a typical day look like for you? Um, on the road or at home? Uh, kind of both. Cause it's probably, you know, kind of mixed, right? Yeah. So at home, I try to give myself um, a lot of mental rest. I do enjoy going to my home club, Turtle Creek. Um, when I'm when I'm back in Florida, I think the people there are amazing. Um, kind of remind me of people back here. So that's why I, I, I like it's going like over there. It's like a second home. It feels kinda, like a home it's, to it's you. It's amazing. The people are fantastic to me there. Very fortunate. So, you know, I mean, I'll go to the gym at whatever it is, 6.37 in the morning come back, hang out with Danielle until, you know, she's ready to go to work and do what she has to do, or she might be already gone already, who knows. And then, um, and then I head to the course for a little while. Um, and then just head back home and just kind of, again, try to like find a happy medium of just trying to relax. But when I'm at the course, you know, I'll do a lot more of the short game putting stuff than I used to do um, instead of sit there and grind and beat balls for forever. Um, and I think that's helped me a lot um, throughout the past few years because I haven't, it was funny. I was telling my caddy, I'm like, God, I haven't really hit the ball that well this year. And he's like, dude, you finished 10th. I'm, I'm like, I'm telling you, I haven't hit it well this year. You'll, I can start, do, I can do better. Like, I can do better here. Like you, you could see, but it, that's the that's credit to me practicing a lot more on on the things that are a little bit more important my my putting average going in the right direction my scrambling percentage going in the right direction and 
and things like that. But, um, you know, again, I found a happy medium to not really overexert myself um, when I'm home um, and then figure out a way to really prepare leading up to the tournament, make sure everything's in good shape. And obviously if I'm, you know, in a spot where I'm not happy with, I'm going to grind. I'm going to go hit balls for six hours. I'm going to go do whatever I need to do. But, you know, over the past few years, I've been fortunate enough that I've felt like I've hit it, been hitting it good enough at most times where I don't need to sit there and overexert myself. And I felt like I'm able to conserve the energy a little bit more and not be tired at the end of weeks and so on and so forth. Yeah. Very cool. So, all right. So you mentioned, you mentioned, uh, your, your wife, Danielle quite a bit, you know, and I think it's so important, uh, you know, to, to yeah. have her support and everything. And, and she's got a lot going on too. You know, she's, she's an entrepreneur herself. Almost from, more than I do. From what I understand. So, so tell me a little bit about what, uh, what she's got. She's got some cool things going on. Tell me about it. Yeah. So she started DM creative house. Oh gosh. Well, she started doing things on the side probably around 2015, 16. Um, she started her business in 2017 and has built it up tremendously. I mean, she has some amazing, amazing clients. Um, she's probably got about God, 40 or 50 clients now just in her business that she's built. A um, couple employees, and then she just got hired as the uh, CMO of uh, Airways. Now, what is that? So Airways is a really, really cool platform. So they're kind of taking the stance on, we don't want any really negativity on, on our platform. And so anybody who's, you know, interacting on there, you're not going to see those people on Instagram or Twitter that sit there and just try to bash you. Trolls. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I just, and that's why for me, like I'm not a big social media guy. I just don't, I don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's healthy for for people to sit there and, and, and bash people. I, again, like I was saying before, it's a lot, it's a lot easier to be nice. And I think being nice is, is such a rewarding feeling. Um, because to make someone else feel good is just, is, is, is such a good thing. Right. So, um, so that's one, one part of it, but it's basically the athletes that are going to be on there. They're onboarding athletes consistently. She's actually got an interview with Brett, Brett Hull today. Um, but, all the athletes that they're onboarding, it, there's some pretty awesome ones. And if you want to go follow Airways, you can kind of keep up with. Yeah, with who, who else signing. is involved? You were telling me a few before before we started. Yeah, so um, so Michael Murphy is is the guy who started. He is a pretty amazing guy. Um, the things that he's done in his life and and the way he's gone about it, his work ethic is is so off the charts. And and that's something that inspires Danielle to be. Um, as great as she possibly can seeing how hard he's worked and how successful he is, which is really cool. But, uh, Michael Jordan's a minority investor, which is kind of wild. It's pretty Uh, awesome. It's 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 kind of a big deal. Um, again, you know, growing up here and, and just some of the things that, you know, we are fortunate enough to be around and see, um, on a daily, weekly basis. It's, it's, it's kind of wild. You kind of got to, bring yourself back to reality sometimes and realize, and then we do that pretty well. You know, I, I like to, you know, I like being back here and just being around people that are, you know, just a little, and, and again, I love everybody that I'm around all my friends and all, but being ac- back here is just a little bit different. You can kind of just take the weight off and being home, not, being home and just not, not worry about it. A little, a little, little less pressure. Right. Yeah. 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 No, no societal pressure. No, anything like that, which I, it's not that we feel a ton of that down there, but it, it's, it's more, you know, it, you're just so much more comfortable when you're back here, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we're, we're, again, like I said, we're very fortunate, um, to have the friends that we have, uh, the people we have in our lives, um, the opportunities that we have in our careers, but, um, the athletes that they're onboarding, at Airways, um, it takes a completely different stance for how they monetize um, their content creation. Very cool. So Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, whatever it is, the amount that they take from the content creators is almost criminal, really. Yeah, basically all of it. Basically all of it. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's kind of wild, right? Yeah. So... Um, like Danielle is a client that 
that had a had a reel that that had I think over 30 million views and on Instagram I mean you wouldn't believe how little that generated yeah probably like like a hundred bucks or something I right mean, it is crazy so what Airways is doing they're completely flipping that around you know Airways is taking you know a smaller percentage and giving the athlete the majority percentage of what they create and there's going to be opportunities on there you're going to be able to sign up and for for the content of specific players or for the whole platform and you're going to be able to watch that and get gain access to those players thoughts maybe what they do on a daily basis and it's going to help you know whether it's kids or whether people are just very interested in into sports and get into you know that that kind of personal life a little bit of, of what they do and you know it's going to be a whole new insight of what these high 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 level athletes do and um how they are so good at what they do that's cool yeah i think they're i think they're gonna do some awesome things with it it's 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 pretty wild to see you know what it started as what it's becoming who they're onboarding um i mean i'm proud as hell of her awesome absolutely man yeah very cool i wish her the best of luck so do i yeah <laughs> So, all right. So what, what has been up to this point? What's been the, what's been the greatest moment of, of your career? Um, that's a tough one. I, I mean, you know, obviously winning school, you know, you, you, you your wins are, are awesome. You want to talk about that, but you also kind of want to think about what the greatest moments in your career actually were. Um, I think the greatest moment in my career was having a horrible 2019 and all encompassed because I wouldn't be sitting here today if I didn't. Um, I was going through um, a lot of pain. Um, golf wasn't fun for the first time in my entire life. Um, mentally, it was the strangest thing ever because I was always so positive mentally and um, I, I wasn't positive. Um, you know, I, I was shutting people out in my life and it, it just it wasn't a good time. And um, it, it's crazy. I just had this, you know, kind of couple day stretch revelation that was like, all right, you lost your card on the web. I was on there for two years. What are you going to do? You're in pain almost every day. The fact you're going to have to get up two hours earlier, is that going to stop you from doing what you want to do for a living? and what you've dreamt of since you've been a kid. So instead, unfortunately for me now, like, you know, if I have a 7 a.m. tea time, I'm up at basically, you know, best case scenario, depending on how far away I'm staying from the golf course, 3.30. And um, you get used to it, you know. But instead of just waking up and being in pain and going to the golf course and then, a week later, I have pain going down my right leg or whatever it may be. Um, but I, I learned so much that year. And I think that year encompassed being down at, you know, the bottom of what has been an entire lifetime of golf for me. That was the hardest year on me. Um, and going down to Latin America and playing the last two events and getting my Latin America tour card back. Was this, was this also the year that you missed that putt? When yes. The fan, when the fan yes. yelled. Yes. Right. So that was that was yes. Yeah, so that was the last the last Latin America event that I played of the regular season. So I, I basically had two Latin America events. In the, um, regular season because I already missed Q school. So, I had two events to go down there, and, I mean basically I needed a top ten both events to keep my Latin America tour card for next year. And I finished fifth and second. 
I'm like, okay, we're getting somewhere here. And then, um, unfortunately COVID hit that whole next year and, but it wasn't a horrible thing for me really. Cause I actually got to take a break and I sometimes don't give myself breaks. And then when I came back from that, I started playing really good golf and, um, I had a different mindset, um, than I previously had. And, um, the support Danielle showed me for what I went through and my family and everything like that. And I think the people in your life are, are very important about who you surround yourself with. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of great people in my life. So you'd say that the, the, like the worst year of your career, of your, of your golf career was actually the greatest lesson that's ever kind of, that yeah. kind of moved yeah. you forward. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've always been told and I will always believe that the way you handle adversity is what defines you. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I handled it pretty well. I think we're in a good spot now and, um, everybody's going to go through difficult times in their careers, their lives. Um, and you might not know about any of it. Um, people might not share it with you, but, um, everyone's going to go through that. So to be able to understand that and to be able to pick yourself up off the ground and say, come on, you're not done yet. Just give it that little extra be able to give it that little extra to be as successful as you want to be, to reach your dreams, to reach your goals. I think that's that's a very, very, very important lesson for people. Powerful stuff, man. Yeah, no, it's cool. Yeah, where it's do you cool stuff? Where do you see yourself in five years? Let's manifest it right I, now. I, I don't know. I you know I obviously you know I, I've seen myself you know I always I constantly see myself with a, a trophy on the PGA Tour. I see myself being one of the best players in the world. Um, I see all that for myself, but you know, for me, I, I've, I've switched a little bit right now because of how long of a year I've had, um, to focusing a little bit more on short term. Um, you gotta enjoy this moment, right? You said you, before you said you were still, you know, it's not even hitting you yet, you know, right? No, it's, it's, it, and I don't, I honestly almost don't want it to hit me really, um, until I, I get a break. But right now, I'm, I, I have four more events left in the fall season. Uh, I'm really focusing on those ones. I think there's a couple of really good golf courses for me to finish out the uh, finish out the year. Um, I'm really excited for them. And I think if I can just finish out this year good, it's going to be much more rewarding to sit down after I'm done with it and go, okay, well, we're on the PGA Tour. And now we're, you know, top 10 or top 20 in FedEx Cup points going into January. Like that's, that, that's a cool, that's a really cool thing. So I'm just kind of trying to look short term right now. Obviously, you know, there's certain times where I'll try to, like you said, manifest the, the ideology of, like, okay, you're, you're there, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing everything you wanted to do. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's important for me to stay in the present right now because of what I have coming up. Absolutely. How can our, how can our listeners connect with you online, social media? So, I know you're not a big social media yeah, guy. No, it's, 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 it's funny. And I'm sure there's, you know, people who listen on here that have tried to reach out to me on there. And it's, it's fun. like my agent handles a lot of it. Cause I try to, you probably get a bazillion requests, it, right? Yeah, no, I, 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 do. I was one of them. Oh really? <laughs> well, that's, yeah, they're Lorenzo, funny. you know what yeah, I mean? Like yeah, yeah. having no, you come on, like it's, you know, it, I, but that, but that's the thing. It's, it's like, I mean, I, I do get a lot of requests and that's not why I, I don't go on there. It's, you can, I, I try to limit myself to how, cause you can get so caught up and just like, you're just scrolling like, like this and like, just like drooling over yourself. Like, I, I like, yeah. and I, and I, I just, I, I think that's for people who want to be successful in things is just need to need a break from that. And you know, I, I, I get my news from Twitter. I, I see some news stuff and kind of keep up with current events in the world. And I look at one or two other things um, throughout the day. And I just kind of try to push it off to the side. Try to focus on your game. Yeah, just but, but focus more on, on life in general, that things that are more important. Because, you know, there's a lot of issues in society now 
uh, mentally and psychologically. And I think a lot of that derives from social media and false expectations that people believe are actually true things when they're not. So, um, so I try to kind of shut that down as, as, as quickly as I can. And obviously social media is great for a lot of things. Incredible. I mean, my wife makes her, her living off of it. I can't say it's not great for, for a lot of things, but there's a lot of things that, that it's detrimental towards. And you just kind of got to be careful about how much information and those dopamine hits you're taking. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, man, this has been great. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you coming in today and, and spending some time with me. I know you're a super busy guy and you got a million things going on. So I, uh, I really appreciate your time here. Yeah, thanks for having me. On. I Absolutely. love doing this stuff. Yeah. And, uh, Keep making NEPA proud, man. You're, you're doing some awesome things. I wish you the best of luck on the tour. Thank uh, you. And I think you're going to do great, man. I'm rooting for you. We're all rooting for you. I appreciate it. Thank all you right. so much. Brandon Matthews on the Stacks Podcast in the Blue Door Studio. Thanks for joining me.